This is Ask a Biologist, a program about the living world, and I'm Dr. Biology. Okay, so from the sounds in the background, you probably already know we're not in the studio. And you might think we're out in the field, but that's not the case. We're actually in a backyard. But not just any backyard. This is the home of our guest, Julie Strongberg. And it's pretty much a wildlife sanctuary inside the city. It's also the motivation behind her new book called Bringing Home the Wild, a riparian garden in the southwest city. Now, Julie is a a professor emeritus at Arizona State University and a longtime plant ecologist who specializes in wetland and riparian ecosystems of the American southwest. For this podcast... We plan to take a tour of this wild backyard to learn more about why and how the space was created. Hey there, Julie. Hi, Chuck. Thank you so much for letting me visit your wild backyard. Such a pleasure to have you over to welcome you through the portal into our little paradise and oasis in the city. You know, that's interesting because when I was reading, one of your friends said something that it's like, walking through a portal when you come in here. And I can get just an idea because, you know, I'm just starting here. And actually, before we head out, can you tell me how big is your quote-unquote backyard? Our backyard and our front yard and side yard. Well, originally it was 13 acres of dying citrus. So we're starting from scratch. And now we have four. We have neighbors behind us who have an organic orchard who have uh, several acres, too. But parcel is four. I envision it as sort of a series of rooms and trails. Actually, it feels bigger than it is. <laughs> you, people can get lost back there. I can imagine. I, I'm just looking out right now, and I, I don't even know where we'd start. But talking about being in the city but having the wild here, there's a road out here. Mm-hmm. There's developments right next door. Yes. It's pretty amazing to me because... That portal really is a portal. It really is. And there are a lot of neighbors around us that are of a similar mindset of us, of appreciating the fact that the soils here are amazing. They're Rito loam soils. They're fertile. This this was a historic agricultural area. And there's just a tidal wave of tiny houses that are coming in. And there's such potential here to have sustainable agriculture, to have ecotherapy and, and just oasis carbon capture in the city. I'm so glad that 25 years ago, we did buy up acreage and don't have it densely packed with houses. You know, they, they have trees and, um, and shrubs and birds. It's interesting because we don't always think about these pockets and how important they could be. Yes. We live in an area where we have county islands. Mm-hmm. And those are interesting because they have not really been incorporated by the cities yet. And they have livestock, right. they have, uh, you know, chickens, you know, goats, yeah. you name it, it's there, big parcels. And they're interesting because it does help basically protect from getting too much of a dense population that right. can't basically escape itself, you know, because it's right. so dense. We've had so many insects and birds and plants arrive on our property that you know, we didn't plant. And... Part of that is because when we moved in 25 years ago, there was agriculture in the area, the road was roughly paved, there was irrigation, and there were so many wild plants that you could find along the the desert streams, and populations of insects come and and populate our property, and our property can then populate others. So we need to have these stepping stones of areas where non-human creatures can thrive so that they can then expand and Right. There's almost like uh, you've heard terms of wildlife corridors. Mm -hmm. And so these, not necessarily a corridor, but they are wildlife pockets. Yeah, wildlife pockets. And I think that's a great thing. Before we actually go for our walk, I do want to get a little bit of a, a vision for everybody. We know it's four acres now, but, um, what prompted you (laughs) to do this? Yes. Multiple motivations. During my life at Arizona State University, I was a riparian researcher, and I spent a lot of time traveling to rivers around the Southwest, and they're beautiful and gorgeous and fascinating. But I fell in love with mesquite bosques, which are woodlands that bordered the Salt River. 
as well as other rivers in the state. And I thought, wow, if I'm going to live in the city, I want to live in a mesquite bosque. <laughs> so that was that motivation. And I taught restoration ecology, and I thought, well, here's a chance to put principles into practice. Like um, Some people say restoration is kind of glorified gardening, and in a sense it is. <laughs> it's not, not quite that. And I do come from a long line of gardeners. I mean, my, my mother was a gardener, and she taught me to love and appreciate plants. And so my gardening fingers just needed a place to, to be active. I also, when I was doing my research, uh, I went to a, a workshop about mesquite as a food source for the indigenous people of the Southwest and for the current inhabitants. And so I've been fascinated with sustainable agriculture for a long time because industrial agriculture is, is so damaging and people need an alternative. So I thought, wow, we can have birds in the city, we can have a food forest in the city, we can have a quiet space in the city. I, the noise of the city is, I just can't hack it. <laughs> so I've got to wake up to bird song, or I'm going to be a, a grumpy ecologist. Okay. No one wants anybody to be grumpy. <laughs> so, so because we're in this wonderful location, and it's early in the morning, so uh, if anybody wonders, it's, it's, you know, it's like 7 in the morning here, and uh, that means it's a little bit cooler, although yes. not necessarily cool. And uh, interestingly enough, I saw what looked like some storm clouds. Mm -hmm. So who knows, we might even get a bit of a desert shower this morning. That would be lovely. Right. Oh, the smells after the rains are incredible. I bet. I bet. Speaking of this, let's go. Okay. Let's, where, where do you want to go first? Oh, gosh. Well, right here at the gate, we have to stop by the, the bursera, the elephant tree. These grow wild on South Mountain Park, which you can see just a, across the road there. And they are an amazing plant with respect to their smells and here take a berry and just crunch it between your fingers and, and take a whiff presumably yeah. you're going to relax yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and this is um, the, the compounds in this plant which is in the family, the same family that frankincense and myrrh are in have been proven to reduce your anxiety it's, it's called an anxiolytic what a great way to you know, if you're going to go to work or go out the door what a great way to start the day <laughs> <laughs> right, and, and it's a great way to bring your guests in. You exactly. Calm them down right away. <laughs> yeah. By the way, when you're listening to this, if you don't know what this plant looks like, we will be putting images in the podcast. We do that sort of thing. If you have a an app that uh, supports that, you can see it. Or you can go to our website, and you'll be able to see them as well. So just keep that in mind. All right, what's next? Well... Let's head out down this path. Uh, right now, one of the lovely plants that's in bloom is the desert willow. That was a short walk. It was okay. a short walk, yeah. So well. I guess I guess four <laughs> acres, you do get to pack a lot in. We pack a lot in. Yeah, so here's the desert willow. And these are trees that are widely planted in the city as, as a landscape plant. Boy, after the rain, I mean, this the smell is it's, it's kind of pungent. And just after the rain, it's just lovely and delicious. The desert willow... The, was one we planted. So we have a mix of plants that we planted and then the wildlings that came in. So we weren't really the only ones doing the planting. The birds, the wind, the water brought plants in. And one that came in was uh, right here, this wildling called uh, Sacred Datura. And the rabbits have been nibbling the leaves on this plant. And this plant is psychotropic. <laughs> Oh, really? <laughs> yes. And ah, it's been so used as crazy rabbits. Crazy rabbits. So they're having one heck of a party right now. <laughs> But the sacred datura is, uh, has big, broad leaves. She's a herbaceous perennial. And then in the morning and at the night, she has beautiful, big, white tubular flowers that just fill the atmosphere with, with a, a wonderful odor. And they attract bees and pollinators, and they come in and they have a party. And <laughs> sometimes they will get sort of drugged. And I, sometimes I've like helped a bee out of the flower because they're, they're, they're <laughs> you know, just a little too much, and they can't, can't find the door. All right, well, we're going to move on a little bit before I join the rabbits or the the, <laughs> the bees here, right? <laughs> Let me see here. What's what's next? Because, I mean, yeah. it is incredibly green. It's right. incredibly r lush. Yeah. Uh, I could think of myself in basically uh, out in the desert in uh, kind of those uh, transition zones. Right, right. And some of our area is irrigated and some is not. So we have moisture gradients, which is part of what contributes to the diversity. So we're in, we'll stay in the irrigated area for a while, and if we just walk a 
few more steps this way. There's a tree that I call uh, the dancing tree. The dancing tree. The dancing tree. And, and not because the tree is dancing. All the trees do move. <laughs> they move very slowly, much more slowly than we do. You know, they will close their leaves up at night. They will respond to touch. You know, they're sentient creatures. But um, this, this is a uh, Mexican Palo Verde. And she's one of the oldest trees on the property. Just huge. And I've pruned some of her lower limbs so that we can go up and climb the tree and just sit in the tree and... and, and uh, Relax and but sit in the tree. Sit in okay. the tree, and but beneath her, there's sort of an open area. That one time I had some friends over, and they just spontaneously broke out and dance. <laughs> so we, we were ah, dancing under the tree. The so she's become known tree. as the dancing tree. Got it. Um, and this is one that some people call her Rotama, a Mexican Palo Verde. In some areas, some restoration sites, one along the Salt River, she's not welcomed, and she's being poisoned and killed and removed because she's not considered to be part of the historical flora of the area. Uh, Now you're bringing up an important point because there's, for those that don't know, there's native and non-native is the common terms that might come up. And there's a bit of a discussion going on to the fact that what is native and what is non-native and who belongs and shouldn't be there? Yes, there is. And it's been going on for a while, and it, it, it can get fairly emotional because, you know, when you're dealing with issues of belonging and attachment, you know, the, the subjective science doesn't necessarily have the last word. And the terms native and non-native are not binary, like many things. You know, it's not black and white. They're shades of gray. At different lengths of time, things have been here, different distances they've come. Plus, we're in a changing climate, changing CO2. I mean, the world is changing, so what belongs here... A hundred years ago is not what belongs here now. Right, and uh, that's really common with uh, birds, for example. Mm -hmm. In the Phoenix area, we have these rosy-faced lovebirds. Oh, yes, we've had them periodically, yes. Yeah, (laughs) yeah, and they're not native, but they're certainly taken up uh, home in the Phoenix area. And there are a lot of birds like that. And in some cases, those birds that were not native... It's important because it turns out their native, quote, native habitat, right now, they're having a great big decline in populations. Parrots, for example. Yes. Many species of parrots are dropping in numbers in their native, quote, native habitats. But they're out in the strangest places, inner cities and all. Without that, we would have a problem. Right. So migration, adaptation, it's ongoing, and trying to stop it, just creating more harm than benefit. And people still actually are being taught that sort of very simplistically, like native is good, non-native is bad. And once you learn that, it kind of embeds. But it's not true. A new creature can have a effect that's neutral, positive, negative, and it depends on who is being affected. And so it's very complicated. And we've reduced it to the simplistic idea. You can become sort of extreme. You know, there's sort of... I mean, I love native species. I plant them in my yard, but I'm not an extremist. It doesn't mean I'm going to hate the others. You know, everyone's welcome in in our yard, except the really, really pointy prickly ones that I step on. And also, I guess my driving concern right now is the rapidly changing climate. And my motivating factor, if you had to limit it to one, is I want plants out there capturing the carbon, sequestering the carbon, taking that CO2 out of the atmosphere that we're releasing into it when we burn fossil fuels. And so if a plant is thriving and doing well and capturing carbon, I'm like, go team. <laughs> right. <laughs> go team right. carbon capture. All right. So green is good. All right. <laughs> so while we're talking about plants, you have another term when I was reading the book that I hadn't really come across before, and it's plant blindness. Can we talk a little bit about plant blindness? Yes. Plant blindness, it was a term that was coined by some botanists who were concerned about the fact that to most people plants are just sort of background material. They they don't really notice them. If you showed them a picture of like a beautiful forest and it had a little bird in it, they would say, oh, what a lovely bird. (laughs) And they would say nothing about the plants. Like when we even talk about, say, nature, mostly we're talking about plants. You know, I mean, plants are the workhorses in an ecosystem. And plants are so critical to our survival. I mean, they give us the oxygen we breathe, the food we eat, the medicines, our housing. They function to help regulate the climate. And they're so critical to our well-being. But uh, courses in botany are declining in in universities and in grade schools. And if I say the word wildlife to you, like what comes to your mind? Oh, you know, pointed ears and (laughs) whiskers and things like that. Uh, Wildlife includes 
plants and animals and fungi, anything living uh, that's not something that humans planted as wildlife. And so that's sort of emblematic of, of plant blindness. Word. I mean, we're animals, you know. <laughs> I, I love dogs. I'm a mammal. I love other mammals. It's rare to find biologists that really like to focus on plants. And so there's a group of people that are trying to counteract plant blindness and just bring plants to the attention of, of more people. I absolutely love this space with the, the dancing tree, but I did promise that we were going to do some more walking around yes. your four acres. Yes. So what's the next stop? We have to visit the mesquite trees. Ah, uh, the mesquite trees. Yes. Okay. Yes. yes. All right. These are a species of mesquite called velvet mesquite. There are a lot of mesquites that are planted in the valley that came from South America, but these were the ones that you would have found along the Salt River hundreds of years ago. And actually, when we moved in, most of the trees had died because the irrigation had been shut off, uh, most of the citrus trees. But there were a few velvet mesquite who had survived. And so we have a mix of sort of the original velvet mesquite and then ones that we brought in, and now they're reproducing on their own. Right, those mesquite trees have really deep roots. Yes. Right, those yes. tap roots that go way, way down. So that right. doesn't surprise me that they are the ones that were surviving and the fruit trees just weren't making it. Right. And mesquite are an amazingly flexible and adaptable tree with respect to their water. They do have very deep roots, but they also... If the water is primarily on the surface, they will grow roots uh, just below the surface. And so these plants are making decisions about where to grow roots, and it's, they, they can hear the water. They actually have a two-step process by which they can detect water and hone in on it. Hmm. And so they're proliferating around right now around our irrigation water, growing very quickly. And the mesquite branches tend to... It's not just like a, a big, tall redwood tree or something. Their branches fall and to sprawl across the ground. So they're as wide as they are tall, which makes it very easy to, to collect with the pods. <laughs> right, um, right. So this tree right here is, is I call her Kui. Kui? Yes, um, which I believe is an indigenous name for mesquite. And this one, have a seat. You can see I've cleared out a little area where we can sit under her canopy and have a conversation and climb into her if you want. <laughs> if... If, if Dr. Biology wants to go up the tree, he can. Yeah, okay. Well, we, maybe later maybe after later. the podcast. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but notice all the, the pods on the ground. They're kind of beige, five or six inches long. And over the past few years, I've been harvesting the pods, learning how to collect them and clean them and mill them and, and cook with the flour. Oh, right. Mesquite flour. Mesquite flour. Right. Yes. Uh, the Native Americans really popular. Very popular. You can buy a bag online for like 15 to $20. I'm, I'm not in this to make money. I'm driven by the idea of sustainable agriculture. Because mesquites, their roots partner with bacteria that fix nitrogen, so they're self-fertilizing. You don't have to buy bags of fertilizer. And they live for hundreds of years, and every year they produce this amazing crop of food, which has protein and complex sugars. It helps regulate diabetes. And if you're gluten-free, like I am, it's, it's an alternative to, to wheat flour. So I seed lots of pods. So how much flour have you gotten this year? This year, uh, so far, we've milled uh, 30 pounds. 30 pounds. 30 pounds of flour. Wow. And it's delicious. And we could have gotten so much more. Each year we sort of learn a little bit better how to harvest. And I'm thinking, when I was at Arizona State University, I taught ecology. I consider myself an ecologist. But here in our four acres, I am part of the ecosystem. I am eating the food. I am I'm breathing the oxygen that the trees are producing. I am tending them. I'm in a mutualistic partnership with these creatures. I'm not just reading about something or writing about something. I am part of the ecosystem. Right. And I can't tell you how lovely that feels, and I want that others to experience that. Wow. So the other thing I noticed is a lot of birds. Oh, yes. I mean, we've been walking through here, and there have been at least two or three species that I've picked up there. Uh, it's amazing what's going on. Yes, and Matt, my husband, is the, the birder of the two of us. He's amazing. We've been keeping a record of all the, the, the plants and birds and creatures we've seen on our property. I'm a list keeper. <laughs> We're up to 159 species of birds that we've seen or heard on our property. Of course, most of those are not residents. Some are migratory. Some are, um, so what are you doing here? <laughs> yeah. What's the most unusual? Oh, well, gosh. 
One of them, they're both uh, rare species, one's um, they're in, endangered species. One is the, um, the yellow-billed cuckoo, and the summer monsoon, this is the time you will see them, and they have an amazing call, kind of like a, a drumming sound. And they're, they've become very rare. Another one is the uh, southwestern willow flycatcher. Little bird. Um, little tiny bird. I mean, just gray, you know. <laughs> it's yeah. like if you didn't really know what you were looking for, you wouldn't notice it. And a lot of the birds I do not notice. It's like Matt points them out to me, thankfully. But this little bird, as the name implies, catches flies. You know, they feed on insects. And this bird has lost habitat because riparian forests and woodlands have been converted to agriculture or cities. The water's been diverted. And it's a migratory bird. It flies from Central America to, to North America and back. And so during a migration season, I'm pretty sure that one stopped at our water drip. Um. And Mads was like, Julie, you've got to come out on the porch. There's this little, you know, this little bird was just darting from the mesquite trees, catching insects. And says, yeah, that's a southwestern willow flycatcher. Um. So, and we were talking earlier about wildlife corridors and migration corridors. And so our property is functioning as a stepping stone for these avian migrants that need some place to stop and refuel, rest up before they move on to their breeding territory. Right. It's a long trip. It is a very long trip. Right. Okay, so I hear a little bit of rumbling in the background, so I think maybe we should walk on just a bit more. So what's the next stop? Oh, yes. Um, it's a little bit of a walk to get there. Uh, we're reaching the, the western edge of the property where it's getting a little bit drier. But look up. <laughs> and what do okay. you see? Well, that's, that's a, it's a dead eucalyptus tree. Okay. It's very, very tall. We did not plant it. It was barely alive when we moved in, but it, it, it did die from lack of water. But in its death, this eucalypt tree is providing so much life for so many birds. I mean, there are cavity nesting birds that are in there. Uh, hawks like Harris hawk and red tailed hawks use it as a perching site to visualize their next meal <laughs> right. and it's um it's one that we had a little bit of a, a, a conflict with the city over i mean having dead trees in your property is not something that they want they want <laughs> right. so we had to have a bit of a conversation about why that tree should remain standing and this tree is a community landmark because you know community is important having knowing your neighbors having some sense of, of place and space and neighbors would walk by and they would tell us stories about oh that's the tree where the hawks have their nest you know and, right. and, and it was just a sort of an anchor for the neighborhood and i think that that sort of made the difference made a difference okay yeah. oh you know you talk about different kinds of birds i have to say that um i have seen some photos from matt of some owls. Oh, the and owls. And the baby owls. The yes, yes. Owlets, is that right? Owlets, yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes, there were four owlets this year. Yeah, let's go into the broadleaf forest. Duck your head, there are some mesquite branches are kind of low. So, a little background. These are three Fremont cottonwood trees that that actually came from an experiment that one of my graduate students was working on. And at the end of the experiment, it's like, well, what do we do with the survivors? You know, <laughs> We're not going to throw them in the trash. So they came to live at our house. And now they're huge trees. And Fremont Cottonwood are trees that uh, historically grew along the Salt River, iconic riparian tree. And now uh, they are home to these, these family of owls and uh, many other birds as well. And this is one of the coolest parts of the yard. Cool as in, in temperature or <laughs> cool as in... Cool as in, wow, this is great. No, cool as in, as in temperature. Uh-huh. <laughs> it's, it's hard to ignore the heat. It's just a pressing concern. And I've come out here with students with my infrared temperature sensor, and it will be 20 to 25 degrees cooler under this broadly forest canopy than out in the open. And that's significant when it's, you know, 110 or something outside, right, or right. 120. And it gets us into this energy use versus water use trade-off. Because some people have said to me, you know, Julie, when you were at ASU, you, you lectured about water and water conservation. It's like, and now, aren't you just wasting water? <laughs> it's like, and so, like, well, it might look that way, but we're not wasting water. Yes, it's water that was diverted from the Salt River, but it's going to very good use. I mean, not just the bird habitat and the food, but evapotranspirational cooling. 
and the trees are capturing carbon. And so it, it is a tremendous amount of ecosystem services that these forests are providing. And also one of the reasons I wrote the book is just to talk about these multifunctional spaces in the city. We're so, as a society, compartmentalized, like in what we do and also the way we use land. Like, oh, this land will be used to grow corn. This land will be used to... Golf. Yeah, golf, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and then we'll have our little tiny strip of ha- riparian habitat along the river. So I like this idea of multifunctional spaces, where one space you can have agriculture, you know, recreation, ecotherapy, climate capture all in one space. And if many people are tending it and taking care of it, you, you feel a part of everything. You're not just so compartmentalized and separate, you know, getting back right. to this idea of feeling like you're part of an ecosystem and, and understanding that we need to take care of, better care of our ecosystems. Right. We're actually, one of the things we, we've talked about on shows before are the community gardens as well. Those are... Yes. And with, you know, 8 billion of us humans on the planet... We co-op so many of the planetary resources, I mean, like over you know, half of the water and, and streams are diverted and used for human use. So there's just not much left over in terms of, of water or space for wild creatures. And there's a big role to play for urban gardeners, urban ecologists, urban dwellers to share some of these resources with our non-human neighbors and coexist. So the storm actually is coming this way, which... For us, we love rain. Those people out there that don't like rain, (laughs) you know, you can come to Arizona because you won't get a lot of it, but soon you will become a rain lover because it's something that uh, we don't get a lot of, and we love these summer storms. Oh, yeah, summer storms. This is lovely. Yeah, let's let's walk over here to the chinaberry tree, which is right by this corrugated um, roof on our, what we call the pavilion, this little storage area. Um, The chinaberry tree... All right, so, all right, well, it's a good thing we got over here because there is some rain here. Yes. So let's let's talk about this. What, you said China berry tree? China berry tree, yeah. And this was one of the, the few trees that had survived when we moved in. And because, as you can see here, this is a big irrigation structure. And it's an old system. It's leaky. <laughs> so even if we weren't irrigating at that time, but the neighbors were, so there was a little bit of water that leaked and kept this, this cherry chinaberry tree growing. It was one of those trees that was planted decades ago. It's in the mahogany family. It has incredibly hard wood, beautiful wood, fairly drought tolerant, but also these big broad leaves. So it's a very good urban tree to provide shade and and cooling, but also withstand periodic droughts. It's one of these trees that are clonal, so she sends off trees have modular growth, so she sends off little shoots of herself. So she pops up 20 or 30 feet away? Yeah, yeah. So that's not a seedling. That's just another piece of herself that (laughs) she she produced. But this tree is fascinating because we heard the cardinal, and we do have this this nesting pair of cardinals, which are just lovely. But in the china berry, actually we see every year, are robins, American robins. I've never seen a robin here. I know, and and I came from Wisconsin, and you you sort of take robins for granted. (laughs) So It was just so exciting. And they were feeding on the china berries. There's some berries that that humans can't necessarily eat, but birds can, and this is one of them. We did have one experience when our, our one of our dogs actually decided to munch on the china berries and got a little bit drunk. Took him to the vet, and he said, yeah, just let him sleep it off, and he'll be fine, and he was. Did he learn? Uh, he did learn, yeah. Okay, all right, well, that's um, good. Yeah. One thing about these storms is they're fun to have, but they don't last all that long sometimes. This one seems to be waning. You said that this was a, an orchard before? Yes, this was a citrus orchard, and we do have our own little traditional fruit orchard. Right, uh, and so is, I was hoping we'd go... Yeah, yeah okay. definitely have to go over there. That's a bit of a walk. Okay, all right. So we'll, we'll start out. You guys get to teleport. We'll do the walking. <laughs> okay, so here's the orchard. It doesn't look like an orchard to me, to be fair. <laughs> <laughs> Looks more like a, like a meadow. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, when, when we first moved in, I was still using the lawnmower. And, but then over the years, I just stopped mow less and less. And I remember one time I was out in mowing a strip in the orchard so the water could flow 
a better, and, and I saw this butterfly, and it turned out to be a, or a buckeye butterfly. Just gorgeous. And I thought, what am I doing? Why am I you know, using this machine to just create havoc? And, and so now the, the, the orchard has morphed into a meadow, so we have some fruit trees. There's a few citrus trees, and then pomegranates, which are just delicious, and then the peach trees, ah, one of my, one of my so, favorites. Okay, yeah. and... Uh, Looks like I could even try a peach. You yeah. should definitely try a peach. Hope you're not wearing a shirt you care a lot about because it's going to drip some juice on you. Okay. Well, I'm going to. I'll try one. <laughs> mm. Very sweet. And then take a look just to the left of the peach tree. We had an almond tree here. We were trying to grow almonds, and. The, the tree just did not fare well, so we just left the dead tree there, and vines scrambled up and over it, and now we have passion vines, um, oh. uh, clematis vine, uh, right. we have snail vine that we actually eat the flowers of, and it's just a great substrate for, for plants for butterflies and also food for us. And so, right. Those passion vines have those beautiful flowers. Oh, they're amazing. And yeah. uh, what is it? The... Fritillary butterfly. Yes, the fritillary. Absolutely mm-hmm. love those. And we have one in our backyard. Oh, nice. So, Julie, before I forget, because I, I know we could spend all morning, if not longer, <laughs> on this, I always ask three questions of my scientists, okay? So, while we're in the orchard, while it's a little bit calm, let's go ahead and start with the questions, okay? You ready? All right. So the first question is, when did you first know you wanted to be a scientist? Was there ever an aha moment, or did it just sneak (laughs) up on you? Oh, I knew pretty early on. When I was a little girl, I would collect data on anything, ridiculous things. Like, I was eating a bag of M&Ms, and I'd keep track of how many red (laughs) M&Ms and how many colored M&Ms. Like, you know, there weren't any questions behind it, but I was collecting data. And my father was a history professor at the university, and my mother loved plants. And I had this sort of data-driven, analytical questioning mind. And so I I kind of figured I fused my parents. um, My father had his intellectual academic path, and my mother was a a gardener who loved plants and all things wild, and I sort of fused that into becoming an academic uh, plant ecologist. Well, the next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to be a little bit mean. (laughs) Okay. And this is just a thought question, because I'm going to take it all away. You can't be a scientist. Ooh. But in this case, you weren't a scientist. Okay. Uh, I know you'd be easily shifting to gardening and farming, so I'm yes. going to take okay, that Okay, you can take that away, too. That was my next one, too. And okay. you've written a book, okay. so I'm going to take some of the writing. <laughs> and I know you love teaching because most oh, of God. us that do that teaching. And what I'm trying to do is, what if I took a lot of these things away that, that were basically your career, your life? If you had gone another direction, what would yes. you be? What would you do? I would be a... Not a trainer of dogs, a trainer of people that have dogs. Really? Yes, because I remember it was this big decision back in, in undergraduate, like, oh, should I be a veterinarian or should I be a um, botanist? <laughs> I like to say that the, the plants ultimately pulled harder than the dogs, but I do spend a lot of time volunteering with dogs at the animal shelter, and it's just that, that that human dog bond just needs attention. People need to be trained, and um, they need to learn you know, dog language and body language, and you know, how to communicate. So that's a passion of mine too. Oh, I like that. Uh, you know, we always talk about training the dog, but we don't really talk about training the dog owner. Yes. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh. The dog usually wants to please, they, but they you have to be able to to listen and understand what what they're about. And yeah, I like it. I like it. All right. And the last question, with um, your years of experience, you probably have answered this before, what advice would you have for a young scientist or perhaps someone who is doing something else? They're in a different career. Maybe Maybe they were the dog trainer that decides they want to become the scientist. What advice would you have for them? I would say get outdoors Get out of your computer screen. Get out of your book. 
meet people, practice, try things, just uh, internships, volunteer experiences. When I was young, I, I volunteered at, at a Schlitz Audubon Center in Wisconsin, and it's a supplement to what you learn in lectures and books. And, and um, So, yeah, just, just get out there and try new things out there in the real world, I guess. <laughs> You know, the other thing, Julie, before I go, I usually say my guests go, but in this case, I, I'm right. going to have to leave this wonderful, wild backyard. Would you do me a favor? Could you read a little piece from your book? Yes. I mean, we've been carrying it around here. It's not a huge book, so no, if not. anybody wants to tackle it, it's not going to take them long. It's and got pictures, I think too. It's, it's, yes, pictures <laughs> and photographs. So it's definitely worth checking out. So the rain has stopped enough so that I think you can do it without getting wet, and I'll let you take it from here. Okay. This is the start of Chapter 5, which I call The Consumers, and it's eating local, snatching the bagel. Score! I snatched a whole bagel from the trash can. I can't stand it when people waste food. I hope no one was watching. I was attending an event at an animal shelter near our house while also looking out for my own pack. We have only four dogs, but that is many mouths to feed, explaining why I get excited when I find free food. As I was driving home from the bagel snatching event, I saw a skinny Rottweiler at an overturned garbage can. She was scarfing down scraps. As I got out of the car to help, to help rescue, not to help scarf, I'm not that feral yet, I pondered the bond between our two species. Food was at the root of our relationship with dogs and remains so today. Wolves hunted with our ancestors, warned them of danger, and scavenged in their waste piles. Our ancestors, in turn, played with their puppies and ate them during times of scarcity. You, One does what one needs to survive, I suppose. A strong and enduring partnership ensued. Waste makes me fret, as does thinking about the systemic changes our society needs to make soon if we are to feed the 8 billion of us and our companion animals without irreparably damaging our soil and our above-ground ecosystems, too. Not wasting food is one place to start. Going very local is good, too. We, in our own four-acre patch of green... Increasingly nibble off the land, feasting from the productivity of our deep, rich, alluvial Rieto loam, prime farmland soil. I don't know if you've tried to feed yourself from your own garden. If you have, you know how much effort goes into producing even a single grain of an edible grass. If you were an urban farmer, I'm guessing it wasn't you who tossed the bagel. Right. Wow. I agree. As much as I would love to stay around, I am going to have to head on home. And it is getting a little bit warmer here. So, Julie, thank you so much for letting me come out and experience this portal into another world. Oh, you're very welcome. It's so wonderful to have people come over and to be able to share our space and our vision with them. You have been listening to Ask a Biologist, and my guest has been Julie Stromberg, a professor emeritus at Arizona State University. Uh, she's a plant ecologist who specializes in wetland and riparian ecosystems. She's also the author of the book called Bringing Home the Wild, a riparian garden in a southwest city. We'll be sure to put the link in the show notes so you can find it if you are interested. I think it's a fun read and a quick read, so it's definitely worth picking up. The Ask a Biologist podcast is usually produced on the campus of Arizona State University and recorded in the Grassroots Studio, housed in the School of Life Sciences, which is an academic unit of the College of Liberal Arts and Sciences. But today, well, you can tell we've been out in the wild. But we didn't have to go very far. Maybe we'll get more of these spaces. Um, think about making your own. It doesn't have to be four acres. It can be small. Also, a quick reminder, if you haven't subscribed to this podcast, please take a moment to do so so you don't miss out on any future episodes. And remember, even though our program is not broadcast live, you can still send us your questions about biology using our companion website. The address is askbiologist.asu.edu, or you can just use your favorite search tool and enter the words Ask a Biologist. As always, I'm Dr. Biology, and I hope you're staying safe and healthy.